were drawing me as an honest student, an honest student. And this morning, Mr. McCasker is in Israel for a week and we wish him well, but that gives us the opportunity to welcome Ken Broswick. We give him a warm welcome in the Lord, and Ken is a Church of Scotland minister, and he's an assistant in Martin's Memorial. And since coming over to the salubrious island of Lewis, he's blossomed and he's telling me his health is good, and it's a, a different world to what he was in on, in, in, in Glasgow and on the East Coast. There'll be no evening service as usual this Sunday, but next Sunday there's an evening service next Sunday when the minister will be back, and I would like uh, to give you all a welcome, and especially those who are watching online. We love to know that you're there, and we pray that this service of worship this morning will be a time of mutual blessing to God's glory. So welcome, Mr. Broswick, and thank you for coming to help us. Well, thanks for your very warm welcome. I already feel so blessed, uh, not only by the warm welcome from various uh, ones of you here, but also uh, from a beautiful prayer uh, that Kenny offered for me and uh, threw in the vestry there, threw in the a wee room through there. I just felt so blessed. Uh, I've sometimes tuned in online and just watched you as a congregation. Uh, I love Duncan's preaching. I just think it is so warm and so insightful and uh, you're blessed musically as well and uh, I enjoy listening to your singing. So it's good for us to be here. Uh, we've been coming and going for about two or three years. Uh, our home is in West Lothian and uh, actually took not well and had to stop full time as a minister in Edinburgh. And Tommy, who was uh, a student at one point with us uh, for a wee while in, uh, down in the mainland, he heard that it hadn't been so well. And he said, why not come up and join us in Stornoway? So I think that's probably all that you need to know about me. And uh, our focus is not upon me. Uh, when we gather, it's upon the Lord. So let's worship him now. We're going to sing together Psalm 84. And uh, understand that unlike down in the mainland, you sing the whole of this psalm. So let's uh, join together as we sing about how lovely the dwelling place of the Lord is uh, for us that if the sparrow is welcome, if the swallow is welcome, then surely there's a welcome place in the presence of Almighty God for every single one of us here. So let's uh, rise to sing after the musical introduction, Psalm 84. <laughs> Oh, 
now let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray together. <coughs> our Father and our God, I do indeed thank you. We do indeed thank you that we've sung there of the welcome and the safe place that there is in your presence, in the presence of the temple for even the swallow and even the sparrow. And we would take courage from that, Lord, that however we feel in our heart of hearts about ourselves, there is grace in your presence, there is welcome. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to us from the presence of your glory, who came to us in your truth, who came to be the word among us. We thank you that so often we find on his lips words of encouragement to believe that if we come to our senses, there is a father waiting for us. We thank you for the invitation that he gave to come to him and to come to him when we felt weary and to come to him when we felt heavy burdened. And if we came to him, then he promised that he would give us rest he promised that he could teach us a new way of living, not only a living in which we are assured of your love, but a living in which we wear the yoke that he wore, the yoke that he said was easy, that would make our burdens light. We thank you when we take the yoke of Jesus upon us. It is no more a burden and a weight than a, throwing a life ring to a man drowning in the sea. We thank you the yoke of Jesus lifts us up. We thank you that the yoke of Jesus assures us of our value, our value in the sight of God. And the yoke of Jesus guides us into ways that are good for our feet, into paths that are blessed, not only with righteousness, but with the peace of the Lord. And Father, you know our hearts this morning you know how we feel with regard to ourselves and you know how we feel with regard to you. And Lord, it may well be that our feelings are not fully in line with the facts. The fact that you so loved the world, that you gave us your only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Help us in, Lord. Help us in by the spirit of truth. Help us into that truth. So that when we go our way after the service, we may be able to say by the help of your spirit deep within that you are Abba, that you are Father, and that I am your son and I am your daughter. I am your child and I am loved, loved, loved by Almighty God. Our Father, sometimes that truth of the love of God, it can trip off our tongues so easily. Sometimes, Lord, we know it and believe it in our heads as a matter of fact. And Lord, the fact matters most because our feelings come and go. But we pray that somehow, by the presence of your Spirit, as we worship you, as we gather around your word, we do ask, gracious Lord, that you might come to us with this gift, that your love would move from our head to our hearts, that your love would move to the deepest part of us, so that deep within, if even the devil of hell would come to us and challenge our right, to say that we belong to God, if he would sneer at us and point out our sin, may we our fierce accuser face and tell him Christ has died and he has died for us and he has been raised for us and he has fulfilled his promise to come and make his home in our heart. And so we pray that every accusing voice, whether we recognize it as coming from ourselves or coming from the devil of hell, would bow and yield to the declaration of your word. There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Take us back to that love that was there before we sinned. Take us back to that first love that set us apart to belong to you in eternity, that in time came to us and opened our eyes to Jesus and drew us to him. And so, Lord, we ask for that gift that not only in our heads, but in the deepest heart of hearts within each one of us, we may indeed say, I'm a child of God. I have a father who's watching over me. I have a saviour who died for me. I have the Holy Spirit to strengthen me. And so I can truly say, not trusting in myself, but trusting in Father, Son and Spirit. I'm a child of God now, and I'm a child of God forever. I need not fear that there will ever come a day when I shall suffer want. The Lord is with me. What can human beings or life or circumstances do to me? I'm persuaded that nothing in all creation, nothing in all time, no earthly power, no demonic power or heavenly power, I'm persuaded of this that absolutely nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. With the assurance that we have a Father who cares for us, who forgives us, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins through the precious shed blood of Jesus. And because of that same blood, we have confidence to pray as we pray in the very words that Jesus has given us, as together we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> well, boys and girls, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> it's really nice to uh, see some of you here this morning. <coughs> and I know that uh, in a minute or two you'll be uh, leaving us. But I thought I would just have a, a wee word with you. Uh, I'm here with my wife, Morag. <coughs> Pardon me, this is my long thing. You'll just have to wait a minute till that clears. But uh, I'm here with my wife, Morag. And uh, we have a grown-up son, David, and a grown-up daughter, uh, Sarah. <coughs> and I'm loving being here uh, in the Isle of Lewis. We come and go a bit, so sometimes we're here, and sometimes we... Uh, live in a place called West Lothian. But you know, if I lived here all the time, what I would really love to have, I would really have love to have a dog, but I can't at the moment because we're always going in the ferry back and forward and here and there. I wonder, have you got a dog? Have you got any pets or anything like that? No, no pets. Well, I'm remembering the last dog that I had and his name was Snoopy. And you know, if Snoopy... He was a lovely dog. He was a great friend. But you know what? He would not have got any prizes at school for being the best behaved dog. I have to say that. And uh, what Snoopy would do is if ever he did something wrong, as soon as I came into the house, I would know he'd done something wrong. And I'll tell you how I knew. He wouldn't be there to greet me. There would be total silence in the house and normally he would meet me at the door and be jumping up all over me so if I opened the door and he wasn't there and there was complete silence then I knew he'd be hiding somewhere and it was normally under the table and I would shout to him Snoopy where are you 
and there'd be total silence. And then I would say to him, Snoopy son, where are you? And I would hear, that was his tail beginning to bang in the table legs. And then it would stop and there'd be silence again. Snoopy, where are you? And it would get louder and longer. And then it would stop again. And then I would say, oh, Snoopy, son, where are you? And he would come tearing out from under the table. And he would jump up all over me and lick my face and roll over and want his tummy scratched and all sorts of things. <clears throat> it was as though he was trying to say sorry. And he was glad just to be forgiven. Here's what I have to say. The next day, he would show that he hadn't been really sorry <laughs> because he would do exactly the same wrong thing again. You know, it's one of the things we're taught to say, isn't it, to God? And we're taught to say it as adults and we're taught to say it as children. We're taught to say, sorry, Lord, when we do something wrong. When you do something wrong, you're meant to say, to your parents, aren't you? Or to a teacher, or to a friend, or to whoever. I'm sorry. But how do you know if we're really sorry? We actually know we're really sorry if we don't do the same wrong thing again. I don't think Snoopy was ever once really sorry in his whole life. And maybe sometimes we've said sorry, sorry to God, sorry to our parents, and maybe your parents have sometimes turned around and said, sorry, you don't know the meaning of the word sorry. Because the meaning of the word sorry is actually, I'm going to try and not do that again. You know, as children of God, every single one of us here gets it wrong. I get it wrong. Anybody that's one of the elders here, we get it wrong. Your parents get it wrong. Every single one of us gets it wrong. And the Bible calls that sin. And when we get it wrong, do you remember how Snoopy, he felt there was something between us and he was so glad when he felt he was forgiven. Well, number one, when we get it wrong, we ask God to forgive us. We say we're sorry. We ask him to forgive us. But then remember, being really sorry, unlike Snoopy, he didn't understand this. It means, Lord, will you help me? To really live as your child. And when I get it wrong to tell you I'm sorry. But when I get it wrong to really mean that I'm sorry. And say to God, say to Jesus, Jesus, I can't do it right without you. Would you come into my life? Would you make your home in my life? I was taught to pray when I was a child, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And that's really how we can become a Christian. We say to Jesus, Lord, will you come in? Will you make your home in me? Will you help me to live for you? And when I get it wrong, help me to say sorry. And when I say sorry, help me to really mean it. Just help me to walk in your ways. I used to be a minister in Thurso, and I was once visiting a lady who was much older than you. She'd be about 70 years or more older than the, the two older ones here. And I once visited her and she said, you know, I've been coming to church since I was about three and I'm in my 80s now. And she said, I don't think I've ever really become a Christian. 
despite coming to church all my years. And so I said to her, have you ever asked Jesus into your life? And she said, no, I've not. And she said, no, I've not. And she said, but once I do, I'll have the house to myself. Well, actually, she didn't. She had a cat with the weirdest name for a cat I'd ever heard. Her cat was called Gordon. I think that's just a funny name for a cat. But she said, after I'm gone, there'll just be myself in the house. And what's to stop me asking Jesus in then? And she did. So you may feel that I'm just getting at you because there's a few of you and I'm focusing my eyes on you. But I'm wondering about all of us here. We might have been coming to church all our lives. But have we ever said to Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. Help me to say sorry when I get it wrong. And help me to really mean it when I do. So I hope these thoughts will bless you. We're going to continue with worship now. And we're going to sing number 142 from Mission Praise. Father, we love you. Number 142. <coughs> sing so well that was that was lovely let's uh, read from the scriptures now let's listen let's hear the word of God we're going to read from Paul's letter to the Ephesians and uh, we're going to begin at verse 3 we'll read verses 3 and 4 and then we'll jump to verse 11 to 14 so Ephesians chapter 1 and we'll begin at verse 3 using the, the New International Version, and we read these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms 
with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then the words in love, and we read about all that in love uh, God has made true for those who believe in Jesus. So we'll jump to verse 11. In him, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen and may God bless to us this reading from his word. May he give us such understanding as he means for us to receive from these words this morning and to his name be the glory and the praise. It's always good to make Christ just the focus of everything as we turn to his word. So we're going to sing a hymn of praise that will help us to do that. From Mission Praise 296, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, number 296. <laughs>
I don't know if you need to know any more about me, but just it may interest you that um, I actually started my ministry 40 years ago. I started in Orkney, in two of the islands there. So although we're only recently reaccustomed to island life, uh, we spent the early years of our marriage and we spent the early years of family life and the early years of ministry in two of the, the outer islands of Orkney, Stronsey and Ede. And actually, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the outer islands of Orkney, you can take the, the shortest scheduled airline flight in the world. And uh, it's from Westry to Papa Westry. And uh, you're no sooner up than you're just coming down again. But uh, if you want to, you can go there and you can take the, the shortest scheduled flight in the world. You know, I've been a minister for just over 40 years, maybe 42, 43 years, and I think in all the time that I've been a minister, do you know what I've discovered? I've discovered what the longest spiritual journey is for so many of God's people. And it's the time that it takes the love of God to get from our head to our hearts. And that's the journey that I want to speak about this morning. And uh, the reason this has been brought again to my mind is actually that we had a, a wonderful men's meeting and maybe when we next have our men's meeting we'll let you know in Carloway so that if you're a man and you want to come and join us in, in Sornaway you can come and join the men's meeting and just enjoy the fellowship. We had a wonderful meeting not just, I think it was only a week ago, and with somebody giving their testimony and his name's uh, Dave, Dave Smith, and he lives in Uig. And uh, he shared that when he started to come around the church, he, he really felt that he was in the wrong class. He felt that we were speaking about things and he wasn't quite into them. And we were speaking about things and he felt excluded. He didn't really feel included in all of the things that we were singing about in worship and he was hearing about as he listened to the preached word. And I really want to think about that word, included, because it's a word that we actually found in our reading from Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just reread from verse 11, where Paul says this, In him we, now, now who's the we he's speaking about there? He, he's definitely speaking about the, the first believers who were all Jewish people, so he's talking historically here about how the gospel began to, to take root in the world. In him, we, the, the Jewish believers, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, the Jewish believers, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, but now he writes, to, he speaks to those he's writing to. And you, you also were included in Christ. So he's speaking here mainly to believers who are Gentiles. And he's saying we were the first to enter into all the blessings of being loved by God in Christ. But you too, and you also, verse 13, were included in Christ. So that sense of being included in Christ, that's what he's writing about here, that very thing that that man at the, the men's meeting said he didn't deeply feel when he first started to come among us. And I'm saying to you this morning that after being a minister for 40 plus years, I'm still finding that many sincere believers, and they really are believers, that sense of being deeply included in the love of God. That journey of the love of God from head to heart, so that I know I'm in the family, I know I'm in the hands of God, I know I'm in the heart of God for time and for eternity. Somehow that certainty and that assurance, it's not quite happened yet. It's a lovely phrase, this being included in Christ. I'm sure you've heard of Corrie Ten Boom, and Corrie Ten Boom and her, her family, they, they sought to rescue Jewish people from, from imprisonment by the Nazis. And 
then they themselves got imprisoned and many of that family lost their lives and she herself and her sister Betsy were put in Ravensbrück uh, concentration camp and Betsy sadly died there. But Corrie Ten Boom, when she got out of Ravensbrück, she, she fulfilled a promise and agreement that she and Betsy had made that when they got out of that dreadful place, they would go all around the world and tell everybody, listen to this, of the love of God that they'd found in Ravensbrück. And they used to put it like this, that the love of God, you know, it doesn't matter how deep and dark the pit we're experiencing, that the love of God goes deeper still. And Corrie fulfilled that and she went round all the world just declaring the love of God in Christ. And she used to have a lovely, wonderful way of illustrating that. She would hold out her thumb and she would say, there's your individual life. And then she would put the fingers round her thumb and say, there's your life in Christ. And then she would bring her other hand and she would say, there's your life in Christ held in the love that the Father has for Jesus. See, Christianity is a faith. It's about faith in Jesus. It's not about what we do. And when we put our faith in Christ, he takes us to himself. And at that moment, we are included in the love that the Father has for his Son, Jesus. And so if you've done what I said to the children, if you've asked Jesus into your life, he's taken you because he says, if you ever come to me, uh, there's no way in which I'll turn you away. So he's received us. And if he's received us, then we're now held in the same love that the father has for his son, Jesus. Let me suggest to you something preposterous. Is it possible that in all eternity the Father will ever turn to his son Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm fed up with you. Get out of my sight. It's never going to happen. Is it possible that he's going to turn to his son Jesus and say, son, I've never told you this before, but I want you to know you've actually been a disappointment to me as, as your father. It's, it's never going to happen. Do you think he's ever going to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, never told you this, but see, I wish you'd had a personality more like Peter or John or James or, you know, it's never going to happen. And yet some of us here this morning believe that God is disappointed in us. Some of us have grown up wishing that we'd been more like our brother or our sister because they, they seem to be the favorite one. <coughs> Friend, if you're in Christ, can you hear this? He says exactly, the Father says over you, what he says over Jesus, which is not, you're a disappointment, you're a failure, I, I wish you'd been more this, I wish you'd been more that. It's, you're my son, you're my daughter whom I love. What did he say over at, at his baptism? You're my son. You're my beloved. You bring me great joy. Can you believe that when the father looks at you this morning, this is the truth. If we're in Christ, he loves us with the same love with which he loves his son Jesus. And he says over you and he says over me, you're my son, my daughter, whom I love. And you bring me great joy. Why is it that some of us never get there? Well, very briefly, let me look at three words that Paul uses here. And you also were included in Christ, verse 13, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Let me just think with you for a moment about each of these three words. Because Paul says that this is how we, 
This is how we get to that place of really believing we're included, that we're included in the love of God, in the love that the Father has for his Son and therefore for all who trust in his Son. Number one, he says, you heard. You heard the gospel of your salvation. I wonder if you've really heard the gospel of your salvation. What does the gospel of our salvation tell us? What is the good news? The good news is this, that none of us have to build a ladder up to God by our own efforts or by our own goodness or by our own good works, that God has come all the way down to us in our sinfulness and in our lostness and in our confusion. He's come to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the cross, he's done everything necessary for us to be forgiven, for the way to be cleansed and cleared so that we can know him as our father and enter into that eternal love that he has for us. You know, somewhere deep down, do you not think that as we grow through life, we pick up this lie, I'm loved more if and I'm loved more when. And whatever that if or when is, most of us go through life thinking, I've not quite met the standards of the if or the when. And it can come in all sorts of ways. I had the most wonderful parents, but you know, I remember when I was seven and they never intended me to pick up this message, but sometimes children are they're good recorders, but poor interpreters. And I remember when I came in at the age of seven, and I'd been 28th out of 30 in the class. And you know what? That didn't compute with me. It didn't mean a thing. And I kept, it meant something to my mother. And I remember coming in, and she said, how did you get on in the class test? Oh, I was 28th and, and out of 30. And so what? Well, it wasn't so what to my mum. It was... Why? I thought, why, thought, why what? I don't, I don't even understand what you're asking. And then it sort of, oh, is, this, is this what I'm meant to be doing at school? You're meant to be learning and doing well. I thought you were just drawing cats on your wee chalkboard or something. And, and then this is how I interpreted it. Now, it, is, it was not, please hear me, it was not true of my mum. But this is what I thought it meant. Oh, I see, this is how the world works. You're, you're loved if you're successful. You're, you're loved if you achieve. Guess what? Next year I was first in the class. Do you know what? It brought me no happiness. Because somehow I'd started to believe a lie, which wasn't true, but I thought was true. Oh, I see, you're loved if, or you're loved when. I carried that lie all through my schooling. I carried it into university. I carried it into ministry. It started to enter into my relationship with God that he would love me more if or when. He would love me more if or when I had a, a growing congregation. Guess what? In Thursday, where I was at that time when, when these thoughts reached their zenith, uh, Peter Nielsen, whose name you may remember, he phoned us up to say, Kenny, I just thought you'd like to know your church in Thurso is the fastest growing out the Church of Scotland. The trouble is when you've got, when you believe a lie, if or when, it, it's an ever moving goalpost. You, you ne you're never satisfied. And when Peter Nielsen said that, it, it was like a nail in a coffin. I, I thought, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Because what if in five years' time we're not growing? You never reach the goalposts. When this lie comes in, you're loved more if or you're loved more when. Did you pick up that lie somewhere? Maybe it was you got home with your report and it said A, 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 B. And your father picked in the B. You're loved more if, you're loved more when. 
has that got into your relationship with God somehow? And I remember just the moment in time when God just released me from that lie. And I was taken into the truth of what he says to Israel in Deuteronomy, where he said to Israel, his chosen people, he said, I, I didn't decide to love you because you were more numerous than any people. It's not because you were better. It's not because you were more righteous. It's not because you reached a certain goal that persuaded me to love you. I loved you because I love you. End of. Have you heard? Have you really heard that? Because Paul says, that's the first word that we need to get hold of to feel deeply included. It's all available for me as free grace at the cross of Jesus. Where he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, he took the chastisement that brings us peace with God. There's no ladder to climb. There's a saviour to receive. Have you heard the good news? Secondly, Paul says, having heard the good news, the gospel of your salvation, you believed. What does it mean to believe in somebody? Well, when you really believe in somebody, you trust them with everything about you. When you really believe, you trust them with everything. And I believe as a pastor over so many years, I've simply recognized this, that none of us know everybody's story and that everybody's story has really painful moments. And sometimes I think when we come to worship, it's as though we leave these painful moments outside the door and we bring our Sunday best as though our moments of failure and shame and pain must somehow be left out there and we need to come and focus on the Lord and worship him. My last charge before I came here because of illness was in Wester Hills in Edinburgh and that's a really needy area. And you know that some of the people could be quite dysfunctional and it could be quite disruptive and so on. And I remember one Sunday just being a wee bit fed up just with the, the measure of disruption that there could even be in the service. And, and I said to people out of anger and frustration, I, I, I saw your minister apologized not long ago on Facebook. He probably didn't need to, but he apologized for something. Well, I needed to apologize for this because out of frustration, I said one Sunday, please would you remember that when you come here, you're coming to worship God. And let's just learn to leave the, the stuff out there and, and forget about it and come and worship him. And we sang that song, let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. Well, the following Sunday, I saw one of the teenage girls and she, in our church, it was a bit charismatic, so folk used to hold their hands in the air to worship the Lord. Some did, some did, she did. And uh, she went out through the glass door at the back. I saw her disappearing into the toilet. And then about 10 mi minutes later, she came out and she came back into the church and she started to worship the Lord again. You know what she'd done? She tried to obey her minister. She tried to leave the issues outside the door. She tried to worship the Lord and concentrate on him, but she couldn't do it. So she worshiped, found out she was being distracted by the issues, went out, went into the bathroom, took a piece of glass and stuck it into her thigh and drew it down to her knee. And then came back, hands in the air, and worshiped the Lord. Friend, she'd only done what I told her to do. She'd left the issues outside. So the next Sunday I got up and I apologised and I said, I want to apologise for what I said two weeks ago. Here's our new definition of worship. 
we're going to bring all that we have and are into the presence of God. And we're not going to leave anything outside. What better thing can you bring into the presence of God who is saviour than your sin so that you can be forgiven? What better thing can you bring into the presence of God than your hurts in order to bring them to a physician? What better thing can you bring into the presence of God than your weaknesses and frailty to bring them to the one who's the strong deliverer? And so to feel deeply included in the love of God can I just ask, I, I don't know you, but I know as a pastor, every single one of us here will be carrying hurts. Every single one of us. Disappointments. Betrayals. I, I think in my congregations over the years, and I look out and I see parents who've lost their children through drowning or through death in a house fire and road accidents and I look at folk who have been betrayed through adultery. I look at people who have known just distress, their, their business collapsing and so on. I, I look out and all of that is before me. And I don't know you, but you'll be carrying pains. Do you leave them out there? Or do you bring them with you into the presence of God? And say, Lord, I opened this to your love. I uncover what, what I try and keep hidden from everybody else and even from myself. I, in your presence, I uncover it. Lord, let your love heal me. And help me right here. And Paul says, having heard and believed, what's the next thing he says? You are marked with a seal, a, a seal, the, the promised Holy Spirit. You, you know, a seal was something back in the Bible days that you, you would stamp a, a package or a letter or whatever with a seal. And that seal said something very simple. This belongs to me. This belongs to me. And even if you left that thing somewhere for a long time or whatever, that seal would always be a seal of ownership. Friends, remember where we started, the journey from head to heart. D don't stop asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit until deep within, deep within, you know that he has stamped you with his Holy Spirit. And he said to you, you are mine. And something deep within has said, at last, at last, I really know and believe and feel that I truly am. Friend, have you really heard? Have you believed? Have you been sealed? Deeply by the Holy Spirit so that you know not only am I his now, but I will be forever. The Holy Spirit assures me of that. It's like a deposit within me guaranteeing to my heart that I will be his, not just now, but forever. Let's just pray briefly. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, it, it's just like seed that is so fitted to the soil of our humanness. We find that again and again, that your word just seems to fit with all that goes on in our lives and all that goes on in our, in our own hearts in terms of our fears and our anxieties. 
My father, time is gone, so I simply want to lift these three words to you. I, I want to pray for every single person here, including myself, Lord, including those of us we've already heard. May we hear, if we need to, may we hear it again, that there's no ladder to climb by which we need to gain your love and approval. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and the gift of our salvation. Father, if somebody here really needs to hear that in a new way, help them to hear it. Thank you, Lord, that we can believe in Jesus. We can trust him with everything and anything. And I want to pray, Lord, that for any of you who have unhealed pain within us, something that we've, we've never quite brought into your presence because it hurts too much, to think of it, to remember it. And we feel we, we just want to turn a sort of blind eye, but Father, these things don't go away. So if there's somewhere, something in our lives, in the storyline, would you walk back with us into these uncomfortable times and bring your healing and your freeing love there. And Father, if, if we're still uncertain, then thank you for what we've read, that the Holy Spirit can seal, seal upon our hearts that sense of you saying to us, you belong to me, you're mine, and you're mine forever. And if we're still, Lord, to become assured of that, seal our hearts by the Spirit to assure us of your ownership of our whole selves for time and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to conclude our service with a hymn of praise, number 708, To God Be the Glory.
our dying Saviour and the blessing of our risen Lord and the hope and certainty of our coming King keep our hearts and minds in perfect peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and all those whom we love and pray for this day and even for evermore. Amen. <laughs>